Hey everyone, uh, this is Abdel. We're just waiting for our host to join us here. Hey, this is Joe Becerico from Security Innovation. Uh, hey, thanks for joining. Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably give it a few more minutes, maybe two minutes <clears throat> to join in. Sure. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Could you try sharing your screen, Joe? Actually, I don't look like that. I have. Okay, that. I didn't think so. Okay, one moment. Okay, I'll share my screen now. Yep, go for it. Does that look good? Perfect. All right, I think um, I would say it's safe to go ahead and get started here. <clears throat> um, as a reminder to everyone, um, this is being recorded. So this will be made available on our website and on YouTube, and as well as the uh, presentation. So once again, my name is uh, Abdel Fain. I am the uh, president of CSNP. And today we have Joe Basirico, <laughs> SVP of uh, Engineering and Security Innovation, who's going to talk about auditing uh, the uh, software system. So without further ado, Joe, I'll let you kick it off. Hey, thanks so much. So yeah, my name is Joe Becerico. I'm the SVP of Engineering and Security Innovation. And so one of the nice things about my job is I get to um, kind of uh, work with a lot of different people. Um, we're primarily a, um, a software security company. I'll talk a little bit about what security innovation does just real quick uh, to give you some context around my perspective and background. So um, yeah, so security innovation has been around for almost two decades now. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty interesting place to work because we focus on primarily three different areas. Um, uh, primarily assessment, so penetration testing and code review and attack simulations and things like that. So really understanding how the attacker thinks and how hackers think. Um, but pretty early on, we realized that um, just finding and reporting vulnerabilities just isn't enough. You have to go into education and you have to teach people um, how not to make those mistakes. And so that quickly led us from assessment into education. So we created a bunch of instructor-led and computer-based training. Um, we actually developed a pretty cool um, 
a piece of software that I'll, I'll uh, show in a second, not in a salesy sort of way, but just to demonstrate some of the vulnerabilities I'll be talking about. Um, and, and then finally, we moved into standards. And so standards is kind of where I think um, you really start to change structurally how people start thinking about software security. And that's really nice because, um, you know, if you start to put in the place, put in place tools and practices and um, coordination with internal teams and external vendors and um, start making some really good uh, decisions around security, then, then it can become easier. Then it f stops feeling like such a, um, a point of friction and starts feeling more like um, a collaboration. We're all in it to build good software and part of building good software is secure software. And so particularly today, I want to kind of uncover that attackers have superpowers. And um, I'll, I'll dive into what I mean by this. But, um, but essentially, attackers really view software differently than you and I. Um, I used to, uh, you know, kind of get a chuckle out of how differently um, I look at software and my peers look at software as um, a developer might look at software or um, my dad looks at software or my mom looks at software. Right, so your standard user really looks at software in a way of what can I get from this piece of software? What can I use this software for? And what are the ends, uh, the end state for this software? And an attacker really can kind of pick apart the details of the software and how it works and, and how it behaves in kind of a second order effect sort of situation. So they notice things that maybe are a little out of place or maybe one time is fast and the second time is slow or um, they see things differently. So they see an input box and they see that as an input to challenge the application of the developer or they see a drop down list box and they don't see the three, <clears throat> the three options that are in the, in the drop down, they see another input into the system that they can put anything they want. Um, not sure when it was, about, geez, it sounds, time is so funny right now. Um, it seems like uh, years ago, but I think it was about six months ago, um, a hacker named Phineas Fisher uh, released this manifesto. And it was really interesting because she wrote up how she attacked this Cayman National Bank and Trust um, and really detailed out all of the different exploits and things. But it also read like not just a guide, not just a how-to, but really like a manifesto of her thoughts and her feelings and her, her tensions across um, a lot of different things. And you can certainly see, I, I think it was originally written, uh, I'm not entirely sure what language it was written in, but um, it was, uh, originally wasn't English and it was translated into, into English. So if you want, you can go ahead and, and actually read it. It's a fascinating read. Um, the link is there, it's that paste bin link. Um, so what I've done is after I read that manifesto, I realized that there were a bunch of little points that echoed what I had said throughout the years about what makes a great um, pen tester, a great security engineer, um, a great person that's going to be assessing the security of your system for good. And so that was kind of neat to be able to see, you know, those, those parallels between how Phineas Fisher viewed like her perspective on what she was willing to do and what she wanted to do and what I think is really valuable for uh, security engineers to know uh, how to do and, and things like that. So one of the first things that's very clear is attackers are never okay with ignorance. They're never okay with kind of getting by on knowing enough. They always wanna know more. They always wanna know exactly how that little tiny thing works. So um, I just looked around my desk and I happen to have um, this Apple trackpad on my desk. And one of the really interesting features of this trackpad is that it makes this this haptic feedback click. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by that little feature. I wanna know how that works. And that is such a tiny 
minuscule piece of software. It has nothing to do with how or that the trackpad works, which it does, it's great, but it's just this little tiny piece of code that makes it behave slightly different than other things. And so I wanna know why that's there. I wanna know how it works. I wanna know what threshold of pressure needs to happen on that uh, trackpad in order to make it work the way that I want it to work. And so I wanna apply that same thinking to literally everything that I see whether it's um, uh, a, a simple trackpad or an internet of things uh, embedded device or a server or a piece of malware. I wanna know everything about everything. Attackers also have this ability to identify things that are out of place quickly. So one of the things that you, know, you might notice as you're testing something or looking at software is you might notice that um, well, the first time I went to this page, it took like three seconds to load. The second time I went to this page, it took um, like uh, half a second to load. And you might wonder, well, why, is, why did that happen? Um, is that because things are cached? If so, how did that caching work? Is that a potential for an attack? Or um, look, kind of thinking about all the different things that, that could be in this system. And then when they don't meet your expectations, don't just assume that it's all okay. Uh, dig into that thing that's out of place and really understand it in a, in a significantly deep way. And then the third thing is what I call um, kind of their mental acuity. So they have mental horsepower, mental agility, and what I call mental bandwidth. And so what I mean by mental horsepower is the ability to focus their whole brain on a single difficult problem. So imagine it's really hard, you know, you have this really hard problem that you're thinking about. Can you focus your whole brain, your whole horsepower of your mind on this single problem and actually solve it. Um, so, you know, if you're working with a 50 horsepower brain, it might, even if you can focus, it might take you a while. But if you're focusing on with a 500 horsepower brain, if you can focus it down, it'll be, become easier. But if you can't focus, even with that 500 horsepower brain, uh, you may not ever be able to solve the problem. Now, second is <clears throat> mental agility. So one of the things about security testing and penetration testing is that you're constantly being pulled in lots of different directions and you're constantly thinking about maybe breadth versus depth. You know, you're like thinking about, did I cover enough different areas of the application? Did I go deep enough on that one web page, or did I uh, reverse engineer that protocol well enough? So you're constantly context switching from, protocols to technologies to languages. Maybe you're, you're um, programming some uh, script in order to do some fuzz testing sometime. And then you're switching over and you're pulling down some tool to understand how AWS has been configured. So you're constantly context switching and understanding and, and uh, having that ability to, to have that mental agility is really, really important. Now, the last one is mental bandwidth. And what I mean by that is just the ability to understand and hold all those concepts in mind. Because if you think about it, some of the things that really make the most sense from a security perspective are actually little tiny threads that go from one piece to another, to another, to another. And so it's really important to be able to remember back to some little thing that seemed a little out of place uh, two days ago and be able to pull that back, that concept that you remember way back then, pull it back and apply it to something that you've just found today. And then put those things together and kind of um, toss those concepts and fuse them together in your mind. So those are kind of my, my three mental uh, acuity metrics, I guess. Um, so this is how attackers view software differently. Now, what are those superpowers? So, um, <laughs> I love that picture. Um, so attackers have these superpowers and I, um, I often think about these, um, what makes for a great hacker or attacker or a great security engineer. And the first one is 
and we're going to dive into each of these more in a second. But the first one is a complete knowledge of the system. And um, this kind of leads me to one of my favorite interview questions, which is um, simply what happens when you log into a website? You type in your username, you type in your password, and you click log in. What happens now? A good candidate will be able to think about that and talk about it for hours and hours and hours. And um, it's just this complete knowledge of how things work and how things are put together. It's hugely important. Second is a good imagination, because no matter what you know about the system, no matter what you know about the libraries or programming language that was used or the, um, you know, how the JavaScript was minified or the protocols that are used or whether it's going over TLS or anything else, you still don't know exactly how it was developed. And you need to be able to get into that sense of what was the developer thinking here? What was the, the architect thinking? And, and how does this actually change the attack surface of the application? Now that good imagination then kind of goes along with creativity. Now that creativity is the ability to, to think of all the different unique failure cases. Understand every single way that this software might fail or um, come up with new test cases quickly. Um, all of that is, is kind of good creativity. And then next you need uh, to be observant. You need to be um, able to actually pick out all of those little things that are out of place. Remember, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I mentioned in the previous slide was that um, attackers need to be able to identify all the things that are out of place quickly. And so they need to have that a power of observation in order to really understand um, kind of what's out of place and what that means for the greater context. Number five, they need a good memory. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they will, you know, oftentimes pull many different thoughts and ideas from, you know, maybe days or weeks of, of testing, and they're going to pull all that together so that they can actually find vulnerabilities that are more interesting or complex. Now, this is one of those things that this imagination, the creativity, the observational uh, capabilities, the good memory, um, these are all things that I, will, I don't want to say never, but we will be unlikely to be able to replace with a tool anytime soon, right? So we're going to have that creativity and observation and apply that, that human observation um, in a way that will make us great security testers. Now, the last one I think possibly is the most important superpower that we have. And I have, I have trained lots and lots of people. I've trained a lot of people that are um, fantastic uh, QA engineers and, and fantastic developers. But without this last piece, they never get over that hump of um, being able to really uh, break a system. And this last point is an evil streak. You really need to think in an evil way, in a, in a kind of a bad sort of um, perspective, right? So um, if I find a SQL injection vulnerability, it's not enough to prove that it's there because I can cause an error message with a single quote. Yes, that's evidence of SQL injection, but that's not what an attacker would do. The, the attacker really is going to be able to like use that SQL injection vulnerability and break it apart to do the kind of worst case scenario thing here. So um, yeah, so those are the six superpowers. Now let's dive into them a little bit more. So the first one, if you remember, is they build a complete knowledge of the system. So as I mentioned, one of my favorite um, interview questions is simply what happens when I click the login button? And different candidates will answer this in different ways. Some will go down the, the low level TCP IP stack. Some will talk about database queries. Some will talk about network traversal. But whatever it is, it needs to talk about lots of different pieces at a, at a relatively deep knowledge of, of that system. And so 
when you, when you talk about this stuff and you start to build up a complete knowledge of the system, it can feel overwhelming because essentially you're looking at this from a perspective of, I, I know nothing, I need to know everything, where do I start? And so my recommendation for anybody is just pick one thing. Um, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like learning uh, uh, how to navigate a new city when you move to a new city. I remember when I first moved to Seattle, I felt like um, this was back in the days of like MapQuest, where you would just come up with a, uh, you you'd go on a MapQuest and you'd say, okay, I want to go to this restaurant. And that restaurant was, you know, two miles away. You get in your car and you'd, you know, you'd have printed out the, the directions and you'd follow the directions from point A to point B. Now, everything between point A and point B was just totally, uh, you know, gone. It had no context in, in anywhere, but I had picked out point B, which is this new neighborhood that I want to learn about. And I start to learn about that neighborhood and that grows. And then I go to, you know, maybe another, another restaurant or another shop or something. And that's point C and slowly those points in my mind sort of start to grow. And as they grow, two of them might connect. All of a sudden, I have contacts between point A and point B or between point B and point C. And if I do that from understanding and learning about, uh, about technology, the same thing starts to happen. You start to build this lattice work of knowledge that then you can apply to almost anything. So once you understand the paradigm of a client server system, then you can start to apply the same thinking to um, how a mobile application works, right? That's just a client and it's talking to a server. It's different technology, it's different programming languages, it's different protocols, but the paradigm, the lattice work of that knowledge is the same. So you start to build up that complete knowledge of the system. And Phineas Fisher, Fisher did the same thing. She says, so I studied and practiced until I felt I was ready to pay a visit to the hacking team. That's a kind of a famous um, hacking <laughs> team, I guess. Their name is actually hacking team, almost a year later. The practice, practice paid off and at this time I was able to make a complete commitment from the company. Before I realized that I could enter with shell shock, which is a specific attack and exploit, I was willing to spend happy whole months of life studying exploit development and writing reliable exploits for one of the memory corruption vulnerabilities that I had encountered. So before she found out she could use this one thing that would totally work, she was able and ready to de dedicate months of her life to learning about um, binary exploitation so that she could get this one attack. And that's the kind of passion and focus and complete dedication of learning about everything um, that I think it takes to be a truly great security engineer. Number two, they have to have a good imagination. You need to be able to imagine how do people commonly use this stack? How do they pe people um, make mistakes with this technology? What are the common patterns and how do people often break away from those patterns? As you're thinking about this with your good imagination, you might start thinking about, well, how would I make this? Um, how would I implement these things? And if I did make these things, what mistakes might I make if I was implementing the same features? And then you can start to uh, kind of layer on. What assumptions do you think were made? What's, what's running in the back end? Was it, is this IAS or is this Nginx or is this Apache or something else? And what does that mean? What are the implications for uh, using different technologies or different languages or different libraries when, uh, when you're thinking about finding security vulnerabilities. Next is their creative. Now, one of my favorite things, and I'm gonna break off a little bit um, and talk about a different hacker, not Phineas uh, Fisher here, but um, there's another hacker named Sammy, Sammy Kamar. And um, one of the first things that he discovered was this thing that's now called the Sammy worm. It's a, um, back in the day, uh, we all used MySpace instead of Facebook. But on MySpace, he was able to find a simple cross-site scripting vulnerability. And he had this goal 
to create a worm that would go onto your page. And then when people browse to your page, that same cross-site scripting payload would execute and it would make him your friend. And then it would take that payload and would copy it to your page. And it would happen over and over and over and over again. And if you read up the write-up, or if you read the write-up of the Sammy worm, it's beautiful because he has this singular goal. He wants this, he knows what he wants, but then he keeps bumping up against all of these roadblocks. He's like, oh man, well, you know, they're not allowing this anymore, or they're encoding that, or I can't use this character in this case because of this. And every time he comes up with a new creative way of bypassing that roadblock, roadblock. He keeps getting through it, keeps getting a little deeper into his goal. And at the end, he has a totally workable exploit that takes over MySpace in, in, matter, in a matter of hours. It was truly a um, pretty impressive thing. Um, same thing with Phineas Fisher, Fisher here. Um, she says, they were using a remote Citrix app to access the SWIFT network. SWIFT is like how you do money transfers where each payment message had to go through three employees, one to create the message, one to verify it, and another to authorize it. So she's got to somehow coordinate three different employees to do this stuff. She says, well, actually, I, can cre I have all the credentials for all of these people. So now I can just take all three of those steps, even though those three steps were supposed to be there to stop any single person from taking over, they weren't thinking like an attacker. They weren't creative in the same way. And so therefore, she was able to bypass all of those roadblocks just by being creative. So what's wrong with this picture? If you think about it, you might be able to use your power of observation and see that there's actually both M&Ms and terrifyingly Skittles in the same bowl. Now, when, uh, this was a few years ago, I had one of my uh, security engineers, uh, as you can imagine, I work with a lot of security engineers and um, they're all pretty nefarious. They, they have that sort of uh, evil streak ethos that I was talking about earlier. And, uh, and as such, April Fool's Day is a pretty, pretty big deal at our company. It's kind of like Christmas for hackers, I guess. Um, and uh, this one security engineer uh, brought in a bowl of candies and he had mixed up M&Ms and Skittles into the same bowl. And he put up a little sign that said, you know, hey, free candy, why don't you take one or take a handful and just throw it in your mouth and don't worry about what's uh, in your hand. Just, just eat a bunch of these candies all together. Um, and, uh, and I watched as people grabbed the candies, obviously pretty tentatively, but some people didn't have that sense of observation. They just grabbed some candies and started throwing them in their mouth. Some people grabbed the bowl of um, uh, a handful of candies from the bowl and they immediately realized what they had in their hand. Because if you think about it, M&Ms and Skittles, while they're about the same size and same shape, they aren't exactly the same. M&Ms are a little flatter and certainly a lot smoother. Uh, uh, Skittles are a little rounder and a little uh, rougher on the outside, a little lumpier. <laughs> so um, uh, they were able to just feel the difference in their hand. And then of course, as soon as you open up your hand and you start looking closely, you see the M's and the S's and the different colors and the different shapes. Uh, and then the gig is up. So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about is, is you're not just being observant for the sake of like, if I tell you to find all of the, the um, Waldos in this Where's Waldo, you don't just, you're not able to, not just able to find all of those. You have this sort of constantly running background process that is always picking things out that are, that are going to draw your attention to something. And that's what I mean by a good obs uh, being observant. So the, a good security engineer looks at things and they say, what is out of place? What's changed? Is it load times or technologies? What's on the URL? What are the parameters there? What's it, is it a get or is it a post? 
a put or whatever. And why, why does that matter? Is there a different content type? Is this HTML content type or XML? Or is it plain text that the browser has interpreted oddly? Um, is there anything that, that went on that was like a, um, anything interesting in the headers? Or last time I saw this error message, it had a period on the end, and, the la and then this time it didn't. Uh, so what's the difference here? And so you have all of these things that you're constantly feeding into your mind and trying to remember about all of the things that have changed. Now, not only do you have to be observant and have a good memory, but you also have to take great notes. Now, I happen to think that, um, you know, the connection can really only happen in your mind, but uh, if you're taking notes, that's a great way of kind of remembering things and, and putting it in the right in their place and staying organized and understanding what's happened. So taking great notes is really important and then understanding the whole context of the application is, is really important. So any error messages or encodings or layouts or load times or other information, superfluous information that you think um, maybe doesn't matter, all of that needs to be remembered or memorized or written down in notes and then review those notes because as you review those notes you'll be able to make those connections so so pull all of that together into your mind as much as possible and then the last one of course our evil streak okay so you've uh you found some issues what are we going to do with them are we going to simply report, oh, when I type in a single quote, then I get an error message, therefore SQL injection, or I can um, put an angle bracket in here and it doesn't get encoded. Or um, I remember, this is uh, how old I am, but I remember when I was in college in computer science that my professor, my C professor, um, told us that um, we need to do input validation, not for any security reason, um, but because we wanted to make sure that um, the application didn't crash on people. And so if they typed in a thousand A's in, in, in uh, um, a username box or a first name uh, input box, that you know, maybe the application crashes and that's just fine because who has a thousand letters in their first name and who would do that? And if they did do that, they probably deserve the application to crash. Fast forward two or three years, and we have the understanding that that doesn't just crash the application, but that's an input for a buffer overflow. And so we need to think about this evil streak. What's the worst thing we can possibly do with this? Um, if you have SQL injection, maybe you can steal all the contents of the database or figure out what your um, uh, authorization level is. If you can um, transfer negative values on a, a, a bank transfer page. Well, maybe you can steal some money, but, but maybe you don't wanna steal a million dollars from Bill Gates. You wanna steal a uh, hundred dollars from every account that you can enumerate. Maybe that will be harder to detect, I don't know. So um, you're constantly thinking about not only what's the worst case scenario here, but what is, um, what's the worst thing that I can do with these attacks and vulnerabilities? So what are those superpowers again? If you remember, one of them was you should have a good memory, but the first one is a complete knowledge of the system. The second one, a good imagination. Third, creativity. Next is being observant, and then having a good memory and taking notes. And then of course, you must have that evil streak. So I mentioned that we have developed this, um, this piece of software that we use um, for training. And um, so if we rewind back, I bet, 10 years ago or so, I was doing a lot of training. I was speaking at a lot of different conferences and um, I was doing a lot of training for a lot of different companies. And um, I was having a hard time demonstrating reliably these vulnerabilities. And it's, it's never as much fun to um, just tell somebody about a vulnerability. It's a lot more fun to demo the vulnerability. And so on a flight to 
some security conference somewhere, I decided to write up a simple five page online banking application. I called it super secure bank and it looked terrible. It worked 90% of the time. It didn't work all the time, um, but it was full of vulnerabilities. I kind of, I, I channeled the ethos of a truly terrible programmer. Um, and I, I tried to write in every single vulnerability that I could think of and every vulnerability that I was gonna demo. And it was a blast. Um, one, it's just really fun to write really terrible code. But two, um, when I got to the conference and I went through and I started talking about some of these security vulnerabilities, having that in my back pocket and being able to demo it live was really fun. And so that was kind of the, the germ of an idea that would then grow into what um, became command and control. And command and control is, is way cooler than that. Um, we actually have, I think, seven web applications, um, an Android application. We're releasing a, um, a couple of really neat uh, new ones that I can't talk about yet, but are gonna be really cool in a, in a couple, two or three months. And, um, and one of the things that makes this really cool is that all of these vulnerable sites all connect up to a central scoreboard. And then that central scoreboard keeps track of everybody. So as you find vulnerabilities, uh, the system detects your vulnerabilities automatically and it reports back to the scoreboard. So you score points and you can kind of compare to uh, people and you can you know, attack each other, not attack each other, but com um, compete with each other. And uh, it's, it's a total blast. I, I still love it and I've been doing it for a long time. So here are some screenshots. Um, I'll be using the one on the left called Shadow Bank. It's kind of an e-commerce uh, site. The one in the middle is account all kind of like an HR site. The one on the right is a uh, shred. It's like a uh, e-commerce site where um, you can buy skateboard stuff and, and spray paint. Um, we had a handful of design goals as we started. We wanted to kind of engage users of all different skill levels um, and have a lot of different vulnerabilities that can be understood quickly, but then also have the same kind of vulnerability so you can keep practicing. So if this is your first time ever learning about uh, cross-site scripting or parameter tampering or something like that, you can take that knowledge and you can apply it five, 10 times and, and look for that vulnerability in lots of different ways. Each of the different vulnerable websites are at different levels, so they kind of scale from um, you know, people that don't know about security all the way up to security teams. Um, we do have kind of built-in hints and gives you immediate feedback and all that kind of stuff. We also have silly Easter eggs that keep everybody fun and intrigued. And then, um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty fun. Um, I'll dive into it in a second. I wanna talk, a little, shift gears back to talking about some of the vulnerabilities that I'll be demoing in a second. So, the first thing that I always wanna do is do some exploratory testing. And what I mean by that is just literally, what does the website do? What does this application do? Um, if it's on a website, what does this desktop application do or this mobile application or this IoT device or whatever, whatever I'm testing, I wanna sit down with it and understand what's it supposed to do? What does a vanilla green, you know, um, all, good case, test cases, what does that look like? Um, what is the functionality here? And then I start to get a sense of, oh, I bet that's gonna be really fun to attack. I bet something over here is gonna be really vulnerable. This is really unique and I bet they made a, a lot of mistakes over there. And I start to think about that and I write it down in my notebook. And then I start to think about, oh, well, is there anything out of the ordinary? Are they treating little bits of, bits of data differently than I would have? Um, or are they encoding something in an odd fashion? Uh, whatever that is, I want to start to write those things down and make sure that I'm kind of keeping track of all those things. And then I'm going to start passive information disclosure and move to active dis information disclosure. <clears throat> now, passive information disclosure is whatever you can observe. So this is things like headers or parameters or URLs, um, whatever JavaScript or whatever it's loading. And then active information disclosure 
is when you is this kind of the first time you step over that line. So the first time you start to poke at the application. Well, I wonder what will happen if I put in a single quote here, or if I put a semicolon there, or if a pipe or something like that here, or there, or, or another way. So anytime you think of like control characters or things like that, that's an opportunity to see what might happen. And when you do that, maybe you'll get an error message back and that will tell you about the application a little bit more. You'll read that, app, that, that error message, you'll find out, oh, I see they're using um, Java on the back end, or that's a Ruby on Rails error, I recognize that. Or no, 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 that's how .NET handles this bit, bit of data. All of these things are, are different and unique. So, as you start to poke the application, you start to get information back and that's active information disclosure. Now, the next one is kind of a, a, an official um, exploit or vulnerability, parameter tampering. And what I mean by that is like literally just start flipping some switches. So anything that you see, whether it's a text box, uh, a parameter on the URL, um, a drop down, anything, any part of a form, you're going to start essentially manually and creatively and with purpose fuzzing those bits of information. Now, if you're literally just going like, okay, well, in the username field, it says that it wants text. So I will try an A. Okay, that seemed to work. I'll try a B. Now that seemed to work. Now I'll try a C. You're not gonna get very far using uh, techniques like that. You wanna be a little bit more uh, uh, creative and really harness that evil streak. So don't go A, B, C go angle bracket, semicolon, slash, question mark, single quote, dash, you know, asterisk, I don't know. S try some crazy stuff, try different encodings, all kinds of different things like that. So that's what I mean by parameter tampering, really tamper with it. Now, cross-site scripting is the injection of JavaScript onto the page. And it's particularly the injection, in injection of JavaScript onto the page that you can control. Now, the way that you can control this is any time that what you supply to the website gets reflected back to you. So my name's Joe, so I'll try to type in a username of Joe and it will go to the server and does it come back and it, does it look the same? If yes, that's a potential injection point. Now from there, Joe's not very, uh, Joe's pretty innocuous, right? Not very, not an, an exploit string that I know about. So next I might try, Joe, um, angle bracket, uh, something like that. And then it goes up to the server, it comes back. And I'm, now I'm looking at the C, did it, was it encoded? Was it changed? And then I might ramp up those, um, those exploit cases until I really have um, a, a full, fully working uh, exploit uh, that, that does something unique or does something nefarious. And then finally, we have SQL injection. And SQL injection is also an injection flaw, just like cross-site scripting, but it's an injection flaw against the database. And what this means is that you're using uh, the control characters of SQL to inject your code and manipulate the, um, the logic of uh, SQL, uh, the, the, the programming language of SQL, uh, structured query language. So that allows you to query the data that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. So let's get into this. So first off, when you start thinking about um, that, you know, that early uh, exploration and information gathering, you know, you want to really think about, um, you know, what, what, you know, what's going on and keep your eye on the URL view the page source, kind of collect all of this information. Um, and then as you're browsing around, go to every little page and do some passive recon. What I mean by passive recon is kind of anything an attacker can gain without providing input. Um, so let's go switch over and I'm going to uh, show off Shadow Bank real quick. So here we go. So this is Shadow Bank. Um, and so just real quick, here's the, the kind of launch page. And you can see like, this is the, um, 
the scoreboard site that we use. And I just click play and it launches up Shadow Bank. So Shadow, Bank's, Shadow Bank is here. And here again, I am keeping my eye on the URL. So that's pretty standard up there. And, you know, I might click around and, and see what's there. Community site about registration page, login. And um, all of that is pretty um, straightforward. So I'm, I'm keeping my eye on the URL, but you know, pretty much um, that's all fine. And now I'm here, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna right click. And I always like to use the inspect, um, inspect element um, feature. Now you can get to similar data with inspect element and view page source. But the difference is view page source shows you the page source as it was downloaded from the server. And this is really good. This is really important to know um, because you know, that shows you exactly byte for byte what was downloaded. Um, and inspect looks at the page as it's currently rendered. So if any JavaScript um, executed or any more data loaded or anything like that, um, you'll see that in the inspect element page. Um, the other cool thing about inspect element is that um, you can, uh, here, I'll go ahead and uh, expand the whole thing. And um, the, um, and if you expand the whole thing, the other kind of fun thing I think is that you can, um, I shall close that up real quick and then come, get, come down here. And um, if we look at stuff like this, we can start to read all of this and then we can use this um, element picker and I can tap here and I can, it takes me right to that same element right here. Um, and then I can actually like uh, change it if I want to. Uh, and this is really powerful um, when you're trying to bypass client side validation or different things like that. So pretty, pretty powerful there. Um, but then oh, right below there, what do I see? To do remove test credentials test cred out account credentials, username, test, password, kitty. Um, so here I am, I've just kind of stumbled across this, um, these, these, t these test accounts. So I'm gonna try that, test, kitty. Dominating. And sure enough, uh, it, 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 uh, it logged us in. So um, it tells us to solve the challenge and, and, and stuff like that. That's part of the, the game, but um, the, the Test credentials is is really um, what we found, and and that's really cool. So we can see that we're logged in as test user. Um, we see like uh, we have a balance, account balance, and account number. And now from here we can start to um, browse around and 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 actually click through and see like oh we can transfer money and we can view different transfers. We can request a loan. Um, you know, see a brokerage. Oh, there's stock prices. That's pretty cool. Um, and uh, there's a, the exchange. Oh, there's a um, like a crypto uh, crypto coin exchange here. That's kind of neat. So as you're going around, now you're starting to collect up more and more uh, information. And this is where we are um, with this concept of this passive reconnaissance. So we're trying to like just now we have some um, valid information. We've found those hidden credentials and um, we can start to browse around. Now, the, the next thing that we might start to do is use other systems. So um, this passive recon, we might start with um, actually something like, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there's um, a website called Shodan. And Shodan is kind of like Google or Bing, but for misconfigured servers. And so instead, I might not go to, um, you know, I might search here. Um, and instead of searching for, you know, my name, like I normally do on Google, um, I will search for um, CouchDB. 
right? And that's just a product name. That's just some sort of like normal product. And what I'll find is a ton of exposed CouchDB um, accounts. And the craziest thing, I don't know if this will work, but um, uh, it's not TLS. But the craziest thing is as you click around here, um, you may actually see a, a responding couch db so here's a server that somebody just has exposed to the internet and um and they're showing all of this information about this random server potentially what's on it or um, all that kind of information and that's passive reconnaissance so i haven't attacked this server yet. I haven't um, tried anything. Um, here's a uh, university. Um, so here it even shows like CouchDB, the welcome me message for CouchDB, the version number. And now I can take that number, that 2.1.1, and I can go search on uh, like an exploit DB and see if there's exploits for Couch version 2.1.1 or what the default credentials are for this couch DB. Um, that would firmly place me into the attacker illegal realm. Uh, I'm not recommending anybody do that type of thing. But what I am wanting you to understand is that this information is enumerated and quickly um, expanded on throughout. So, um, you know, the, the, um, these search engines exist and they're very, very powerful. The next thing that's important to do to, to an application that you're testing for yourself is um, active reconnaissance. So I think of this as kind of rattling door handles, right? So as you're walking down a hallway, maybe instead of, um, you're not necessarily gonna go in that room, but you just wanna know if that door handle is locked. And if it's locked, uh, then no problem, you'll move on. And if it's not, oh, look, it'll open. And, and you kind of like look in there, peek in there and see, see what's happening. So this is the active recon. And here we're starting to use control characters. And here I put the single quote and the angle bracket, the semicolon, the dash dash, the semi, the octothorpe or hashtag as the kids are calling it these days. This, these are all what we call control characters. And they all have different powers and purposes depending on their context. Single quote and semicolons, dashes and, and uh, uh, the hash sign all have, um, are all used in SQL in other places, but mostly in SQL injection. And then angle brackets are mostly used for HTML and JavaScript and um, cross-site scripting. So as you start to do this, you start to collect up more what's running and how do I feel about it? Do I feel that it's pretty secure or not? Next is OSINT, open source intelligence. So here's where I start to gather information and data about everything out there. So um, uh, you know, open source intelligence uh, is, is really hard. Uh, it's really hard to keep, um, you know, your, your footsteps clear or, you know, everything um, off the web. There are um, this, this whole OSN framework, you can go to osnframework.com and you can go through and see uh, that you can use these different search engines in different ways um, or different tools in different ways to discover usernames or email addresses and then um, uh, connect them in different ways. Uh, and and it's, it's a pretty powerful sort of framework for collecting up lots and lots of information. So I just looked at the time and I apologize, I'm getting toward the top of the hour, but I do wanna talk about a few attacks. And um, if you can stick around, I'll keep talking as long as they don't shut me down, but um, I'll keep talking and hopefully it'll all be um, nice and, and fun and exciting. So the next thing I wanna talk about is cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is um, mixing code and data using control characters in the web page. So code is what the developer wrote and data is what you supplied. And now you're adding control characters to your data, which helps, or, causes the application to not to be able to understand the difference between your data and the code that it's supposed to execute. So you're gonna try this 
anywhere that you can control a value on the page. So HTML or JavaScript or headers or anything like that. And then you're going to try to figure out how your data is being encoded. So here, I'm going to log out. I'm going to lead you to this one because I don't want to spend too much time here. But as you can notice, if I type in a uh, uh, username that doesn't exist, I will get this um, sorry incorrect username or password. Now, it doesn't reflect what I typed there. What it does is I notice that it's this text comes from this part of the URL. It's actually, it says error message. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try, um, like I always do, hello world, and see what happens. And sure enough, hello world comes back right here. The next level is to see if it's encoding anything. And so next I'm gonna try one of my favorite tags in the world, marquee. And marquee, if, especially if I don't close it, if I don't close the marquee tag, it just scrolls everything by in a kind of a, a silly sort of way. And that's always fun. The next level is to actually try some script. Um, and what I'll do here is a simple, simple alert. And we'll just see if it, um, if it works. And if it does, it'll actually pop up a little message box. And, and I typed in script alert one. And so it, type, it pops up that one. Um, and that, and that <laughs> site scripting works. Um, but I can type anything up here, right? So I could do um, you know, my name and I get a real you know, popular, there you go. Um, or I can be a little bit more nefarious and start to query the web page. So now I can see my J session ID and using that same JavaScript, I could be able to actually execute my own code and send that same information off to um, my own attacker controlled server, right? So I could post that information or get that information off to my server, which is pretty powerful. Next, I wanna talk about SQL injection. And SQL injection is mixing code and data using control characters in database queries. Now here's Phineas Fisher again. She says, I didn't get anywhere with hacking team, but I was lucky with Gamma Group, another hacking group. Um, and I was able to hack their customer support portal with basic SQL injection and file upload vulnerabilities. So um, she actually used this same attack um, in order to exploit an attack a full-on bank uh, in the Cayman Islands, which I think is just, again, just beautiful. Um, so try this. And um, one of the reasons why I wrote that orange text the way that I did is I think it's really important to understand that SQL injection and cross-site scripting are kind of like cousins of security vulnerabilities. Basing code and data using control characters, right, for, for a web page or for a database query. And in this case, we're attacking the database and we're using things like single quotes and, and uh, semicolons and, and comments. And so the first thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna go back to the, the um, website here. And um, the first thing that I always wanna do when I'm thinking about uh, SQL injection is, 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 like I mentioned earlier, literally just a single quote. I'm just gonna type in a single quote and see what happens. I type that in and I hit log in and I see um, an error message. And the error message, thankfully for here, is very, very verbose. You're not always this lucky, but in this case, it's pretty good. And so I actually see this error executing SQL query, select account ID, username, balance, and real name from accounts where username equals tick, 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 which causes an error because you shouldn't have three, but the middle one is the one that I gave. And pass hash equals this, this hash. So if I go back, um, I can try something else, right? So I can actually use my knowledge of um, SQL to manipulate the logic of that SQL query in order to bypass the, this login control. Unstoppable. And here I've just bypassed that entire login control and I'm now logged in as the shadow, 
which is a great name. <laughs> so finally, um, after we do all this exploitation, we have a toehold in the application, where does this lead us? And this is where we really wanna start to like go through, um, you know, where the wardrobe uh, takes us, right? Like how deep does this rabbit hole go to mix my movie metaphors? Um, attackers think differently than, than we do. Um, we have to understand, understand what makes them tick to be successful. Um, what are their goals? What are their techniques? What are their tools? How do they think about these things? And if we can understand that, we can understand what they do and how they think, then we can be more successful. So don't just look to the auditors and compliance folks. Clearly audit and compliance and regulations are very, very, very important and we have to follow those things, but there's so much more. We need to be able to be creative and potentially malicious attackers. One of my favorite quotes um, is, you don't have to run faster than the bear, you just have to run faster than the guy next to you. Um, and this is this became super clear to me because Phineas Fisher said that she didn't set out to to hack this specific bank. She didn't try to attack this Cayman Islands bank out of all the banks. What she did is she had um, one scanner that she scanned every bank that she could think of, and she found uh, you know maybe a half a dozen that looked very very weak. Right, so once she decided that, ah, this is a good target because out of the thousand banks that I, I scan, this seems to be the weakest, that's all that they're trying to do. So my, my, uh, my recommendation to you is that try not to think about the, the idea of, oh no, I have to fix every security vulnerability in the world. I have to you know, get everything done. You don't, all you have to do really is be more secure than your peers. And that's an achievable goal, at least, you know, for a while until your peers catch up and then you have to keep getting more and more and more secure. But at, if you're always moving forward, you, you'll get closer. So what can you do? I think that starting and understanding a, create, a culture of security is really important. Um, defining standards and policies is really important to start out with. Um, require system updates and patching um, that can really uh, raise the bar, uh, test and define authentication and identity and access control, centralized and tuned logs, and then audit those logs and make sure that you have the right uh, logs in, in place and they're actually valuable. Um, Phineas Fitcher again, the best way to learn to hack is by hacking. Put together a laboratory with virtual machines and start testing things, taking a break to investigate anything that you don't understand. So there's that deep understanding that she, she really wanted to have. Now, um, that's it. And so, I, again, I apologize for going over time. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. Um, here's my email address, jbaserico at securityinnovation.com. Um, there I am on LinkedIn. Feel free to, to, to connect if you feel so inspired. Um, and then I have just started uh, tweeting again. Um, so you can find me on Twitter if you'd like, at Joe Spikey. Um, and, uh, and that's my face. <laughs> so um, yeah, so if you have questions, just shoot them over to the webinar chat um, and I'll, I'll start answering them. So, hey. oh, sure. Oh no, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna start answering questions, but. No. Okay. Yeah, um, fantastic presentation. Um, and I want everyone to keep in mind that Security Innovation is a CSNP sponsor. Uh, in fact, we've had multiple hackathons or cyber range with uh, security, security Innovation and people find it very helpful. So thank you, Joe. And we hope to continue to uh, providing our members um, this sort of secu security educational contents. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, and we do these for a lot of different like security conferences and right now we're not doing them for live security conferences, but we are doing like virtual mm -hmm. um, cyber ranges and, and you're right, they're, they're just a lot of fun. Um, yeah. You know, it's a great opportunity to learn some things about security or to dust off those old skills or, or whatever, so. Absolutely. 
So we did have one question, um, and I and I think this aligns with Security Innovation's mission, right? Um, you have this platform. Your goal is to educate people. So someone is asking about CEH or OSCP, and and I guess this person is new to the field, and they kind of wanted to get a better sense of where they should start off. Yeah, um, I think that. Um, it, it, it largely depends on what you want. Um, so if you want to um, get into the field and it's important to you to, to kind of show or prove that you are, that you, you know some baseline, then some of those certifications like the CEH or the OSCP can um, be pretty useful. Um, I really like the OSCP or the OSWE, um, uh, those companies are are great and they they put together a really good um, uh, certification platform the um, my concern is the OSCP is um, largely network and exploitation based and so it's really focused on um, like finding and exploiting binaries and and network vulnerabilities and things like that um, which could be really is um, really impactful. Um, it's very difficult. Um, it, it's not something that I would recommend for someone starting out in the field. Um, the CEH is great, the Certified Ethical Hacking uh, Certification. Um, it's good. Um, <laughs> I have a funny story about um, misreading a, um, a resume once. Um, they wrote that they had a CH, and I just assumed that it was a CEH, and it turned out that they weren't a certified ethical hacker, they were a certified hypnotist, um, which was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. They ended up getting the job. So there you go. I don't know if I was just hypnotized or, or what happened. Um, so I do recommend um, reaching out and learning to that. I also really like the OWASP uh, organization. So if you go to OWASP.org, they have really great information there. Um, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube, a lot of learning opportunities. Um, and, uh, and things like that. Lots of good blogs to read of different technical levels and beginners and things like that. Um, and then a lot of good security conferences. I don't know if, uh, you know, security conferences are going to be a thing this year, but if they are, um, I highly recommend uh, a couple of good security conferences. Obviously, everybody knows about DEF CON. That's great. Um, and that has a lot of new, new engineer support there, but then it also has um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, great opportunities for, for old hackers. Um, and then there's one that, that's kind of my favorite and, um, it's in, in, um, uh, San Diego uh, called TourCon and T-O-O-R-C-O-N. Um, and I love it because it's small and, um, and the speakers are super, super knowledgeable and they're easily approachable. Um, it's just a really great, feeling of a conference. So um, if you're thinking about starting out in the security field, those are a couple of good opportunities. Okay. And uh, we do have another question here. Um, someone in the uh, incidents response um, has experience um, in that and as well as uh, DLP. And I guess they're trying to break into uh, AppSec um, and they're wondering how can they go about that? Yeah. So my answer would be, um, so coming from where you are and DLP and, and those kinds of ideas, the thing that you're going to have already is that, that evil streak. You can think about how nefarious people are going to attack your system. Um, especially, um, I actually spoke a long time ago on a panel about um, DLP solutions. And, um, and <laughs> I was the only person that was like, uh, there's nothing to be done. Like, <laughs> there's no way to stop uh, a nefarious, intelligent actor from exfiltrating data from your network. <laughs> there's just too many ways um, to get things out. Um, but if you think in those terms, then you can start thinking like, oh, okay, well, an attacker does this. How can we stop them from doing that? An attacker does that. How can we stop them from doing that? Kind of toggle back and forth. It can be really 
a powerful way of thinking. Um, essentially, you're you're learning threat modeling in a certain area. Um, so I love it. I love that kind of thinking. Um, if you're trying to get into uh, security more generally, I would say just um, pick a topic that you feel like you know some stuff about and that you feel comfortable about. So you know maybe DLP and incident response. Um, maybe an easy segue would be um, more of the network or um, certification and compliance sort of thing. So um, maybe instead of going for an OSCP, you might go for a CISSP. Um, that can be a, a good certification to give you a broad um, kind of platform to start to learn about lots of different things. And then you can kind of figure out what sticks or what you're most interested in. Um, from there, if you're interested in the more application side of things, um, you know, I think web applications honestly are a really uh, nice place to start. Um, it's, it's something that you can get your hands on. There are lots of vulnerable examples. Um, you can, you know, it's pretty accessible. Localhost proxies are really easy to set up so you can see what's going on in the back end. Um, it's a good place to start, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. So that was the last question. Um, thank you again, Joe. This was really fantastic. Um, I think this was a great learning opportunity for everyone and really hope to uh, have you again. Great. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure and uh, I'll try to stick to the hour next time. <laughs> Sorry for going over. Hey, um, no worries. Uh, educational content is help, you know, it's helpful to everyone. So I don't think there's much complaints there. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. so Bye. Much.